Hello and welcome. I'm Austin Kovalarczyk, arranger and composer. And I, today I'm bringing you a video about a topic I feel pretty strongly about. So I like to think we're in an era of composition where we're kind of blessed with the concept that composers are really willing to experiment with timbral and instrumental choices. You know, people are willing to push the boundaries and write for strange, wonderful, and unique ensembles. But I also believe that there's this push as there always has been, towards towards a standardization that doesn't include so-called defunct or antiquated instruments. Frequent examples include the dismissal of, you know, the soprano saxophone, the alto clarinet, D-flat piccolo, contrabassoon, contrabass, contra-alto clarinets, bass saxophone, English horn even. You know, p instruments that were commonplace in wind band repertoire, let's say, not even 100 years ago, you know, 70 some years ago. They're just kind of being pushed to the side. Some examples of this, of course, make sense. Uh, take the D-flat piccolo, which was a monster of an instrument, mainly because it was badly designed and the tuning system was atrocious to try and get right. Or the contrabassoon, which just costs an exorbitant amount of money, you know, and some programs just would struggle getting their hands on one. But in other cases, there's this almost deliberate removal of instruments that are integral to the families that they're a part of and just being ignored from the wind, ense wind band, wind ensemble wind band. So let's take, for example, you know, the saxophone family. Soprano, alto, tenor, berry. Not exactly what you think of when you think of a family. You'll think soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And, you know, that's the case, is we've got... The bass instrument of the saxophone family is being left out. You know, not even, you know, 1957, Leonard Bernstein was writing for bass saxophone in West Side Story. But, you know, Leonard Bernstein used it. Percy Granger, a famous wind band composer, you know, one of the preeminent in my mind. These are, you know, Holst called for it. And Gustav Holst is a huge name in wind band repertoire. And yet we're just eliminating this vital member of the saxophone family that adds a deeper timbre you know, lower range, we're just cutting the family off at its knees, basically. And I think that's a, it's a shame, honestly. But say, we can, we can point out other examples of this. We've got the alto clarinet, the true alto voice of the clarinet family. I, I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a clarinet performer, a serious one at least, who's played in clarinet ensembles or clarinet choirs, who wouldn't agree that there has to be a, an alto clarinet and a clarinet ensemble slash choir to make it a complete ensemble you know take for example the composition of a clarinet quartet it's three sopranos and a bass usually which is different from the violin violin viola cello that we see in a string quartet you know that's two soprano voices an alto and a tenor and we're not seeing that in the clarinets and we get the same issue when we look at wind band writing if you look at a wind band piece typically you're going to see you know soprano and bass clarinets and that's it maybe you'll get the e flat soprano clarinet once in a while if you're lucky or unlucky depending if you're playing it or not but we're just missing out on this wonderful alto voice and i think the reason behind it's pretty clear you know many directors complain at least ones that i've heard that these instruments are subpar and they don't sound good but there's that's usually their fault you know, the alto clarinet, because of their bias against it, isn't going to be the first on the list to receive maintenance regularly or even infrequently, but necessarily. You know, they usually give it to one of their weaker players who are typically playing third clarinet because you want to keep all your strong players on first and second. And I don't disagree with keeping strong players and harder parts, but giving your, let's say in a high school band, you've got a third clarinet player in your concert band and you go, here, take this alto clarinet for a song. Chances are, depending on the program, that student might not be the most motivated or interested in band, and they're just doing it to get something out of the way. And then, consequently, for a variety of reasons, they might not sound good. You know, technical, psychological. But the director frequently blames that on the instrument itself. You know, and I won't lie, there's... The bias that they're not well-designed is probably well-deserved because of the demand for it. Major companies haven't updated their haven't updated their design since the 1980s. You know, Yamaha and Selmer at the very latest were like 1988, and other companies haven't updated since before then. You know, and that, that feeds into it. D 
conductors think this is a badly designed instrument. They're going to purchase it for their program. You know, and since there's no demand for it, they're not going to update these instruments. And since you've got this bias against it from conductors and players alike, you know, I'll speak for myself. I used to hate the damn instrument. Now I play on it fairly frequently. You know, this demand's gone down, so they're not going to write for it. Composers aren't going to write for it as much. Which just feeds into the circle again, where they don't see it. Band directors aren't going to need it or want it or program something with it. Which means they're not going to need a new one. They're not going to want to get theirs updated which just feeds into this demand feedback loop the whole over and over again. You know? And it's it's ridiculous. Let's let's talk about a specific example here, like Holst's first suite in E flat. Gustav Holst, if you're not familiar with the wind band tradition, uh, wrote his first suite in E flat for I think he calls it military band. And this is considered one of the primary pieces of the wind band repertoire. One of the earliest ones written, written explicitly for wind band. One of the earliest ones that's still in performance today at least. That's not a transcription of something else for wind band. And I think that one came out, yeah, the original version came out in 19, 1921. But recently uh, there is a revised edition and I, I use that term lightly. I prefer defaced and highly incorrect, but the program notes in that score proclaim, This arrangement is a modernized version of Holst's original score. It provides modern instrumentation. The original 1921 Boozy & Co. edition featured many antiquated instruments such as E-flat alto clarinet, B-flat bass saxophone, and horns in E-flat. Let me digest that for a second. Now I'm going to talk about how that's wrong. You know, uh, first of all, I'm pretty certain horns in E-flat are still widely used in British brass bands. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's quite a number of British composed and published bands that, band pieces that use horns in E-flat. Of course, you've heard my instruments for the B-flat and alt B-flat bass saxophone and E-flat alto being well included in the wind band canon, but they don't even mention the fact that in this version, they replaced, they took out the contrabass clarinet part. Now, the contrabass clarinet part is integral to the piece, in my opinion. In the opening of the Chaconne, the first movement, there is a trio that's supposed to be played. If you look on most scores these days, it's now a duo, because it's written for tuba, euphonium, and a contrabass clarinet. So if you're buying this revised edition, you're missing out on the original sound Holst was going for. You know, and as someone who plays contrabass clarinet myself, I think that's a travesty. I think that's just ridiculous. But, you know, not not every band has a contrabass clarinet. I understand that. But I think if we look nowadays, we can understand that if there's a demand for these things, they can be produced efficiently and cost-effectively. Take, for example, yes, there's a company out of Nevada known as Kessler & Sons, instrument selling company, that has their own in-house line of low-C bass clarinets. Why is this special, you may ask? One simple reason. These low-C bass clarinets are... A usually around a fourth of the price of the professional models, and tend to stand up pretty well against them in direct comparison. You can check out Michael Lauerstein's channel for his review of the low C bass clarinets from Kessler, and I'll leave a link in the description. But, you know, these are for $2,500 when you buy them through Kessler & Sons. Of course, they're marked up a bit more than that if you buy them through a different company. But that is a fraction of the price of the typical bass clarinet especially a low C extension, you know, Yamaha's intermediate low E flat bass clarinet is the same price. So what I'm getting at is, you know, there's a demand for this instrument, and Kessler & Sons has found a way to manufacture it cost-effectively and still produce a good instrument, you know? I think we're well past the days where, like, if you think about saxophones, we're worried about cheap Taiwanese and Chinese stencils of horns flooding the market that are ineffective and can't be repaired properly. You know, are, I'm not saying those are completely gone, but I think we can see nowadays that these these horns are good instruments for what they're worth. And the Kessler & Sons bass clarinet is a superior instrument for its price point. And I don't think it would be hard to say that if there was a demand for other instruments that are usually harder to get their hands on, say the contrabass clarinet or the, you know, bass saxophone, we could find a way to manufacture these more cost-effectively. 
Now, they'll never compare to a $30,000 B-flat bass saxophone that was custom-made for you by one guy in a shop who has been making just bass saxophones his entire life. But that's not what they need to be, you know? When I think it's up to composers like us and any advocate who's watching to really try to revitalize the scene here. We need... We can bring back the demand for these instruments. We can... We can turn the landscape of the wind band and other ensembles even into a more exciting more possibility filled example or more possibility filled ensembles when's the last time you heard an alto clarinet solo in an orchestra who's to say there shouldn't be one you know maybe some composer who's going to write some great alto clarinet concerto is living right now i hope it's not me but you know, there's, we can revitalize even just a little bit the demand for these instruments. We could probably hook some kid into playing music for the rest of their life. You know, there are people out there who exclusively perform on alto clarinet when they get the chance. And they're wonderful people. They're inspired. They're dedicated to their instruments. But they're not going to get the recognition they deserve unless there's a place where we can, we can foster their growth. You know, and maybe one day, with the right environment, some kid will pick up an alto clarinet or a bass saxophone and just go, this is it. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. But without that chance, especially in the wind band sphere, you know, the majority of kids, I, I think, are growing up in a high school wind band or orchestra. Without that wind band chance to pick up those instruments, they might never find out that they love music. So I'm basically just putting out a bit of a call towards other composers and saying, please, include these instruments in your scores, you know, write parts for them, write small solos for them in piano, anything to include, anything to increase and include them in the repertoire. You know, I'm making my best bet at trying to do so. I know there are other students, composers, and other professional composers who are still trying to do so, but I think if we can see more of a push, that would only help. So yeah, that's my little spiel. If you've got an opinion you'd like to voice on this, please leave it in the comments. I've, I'm always up for debate about this, as my classmates might be able to tell you. I'm loud about it. I won't shut up about it half the time, but I'm the weird instrument guy at school. So, But yeah, if you have discussion you want to start, leave it in the comments. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. It's been busy for me, end of the semester here. Just finished up, taking a week off. And... You know, I can't wait to see what kind of discussions and what kind of pieces come out of something like this, you know, and I'll leave some extra videos and stuff in the description, a paper or two that I was reading before this that helped kind of inspire this little rant. But yeah, do all the YouTube things, like, subscribe, whatever. If you like this, I've got a bunch of book reviews if you like that. I'm planning on more composing stuff in the future. Bit of a sneak peek for the next book review, Simple Flutes. It's an interesting book, but I'll see you next time. Thanks.